Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I would ask you tonight as we launch into this series on grace, that it wouldn't be the ideas, the thought processes of myself or of this house, God, any man or woman, God. We didn't come to hear from a man or a woman. We didn't come to hear from the young or the old. We didn't come to hear from the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. We came to hear from you. Holy Spirit, be welcome in this place. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your direction, your instruction, even the correction we need, Lord, where we're off, God. Get us back on track with you. Lord, help us to understand, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Help us to live this out in our everyday life with you, Lord. And we thank you, God, that you give us the strength and the power to do just that. Also, God, we wouldn't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. We would ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are brothers and sisters, Lord, and no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. And so, God, we thank you that you bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapel, Harvest, uh, Ecclesia, the Way, Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, the Assemblies and the Four Square Denominations. God, too many to name by name. But God, if they're preaching your gospel, lifting up your name, God, we bless them. Bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, God. Those that are lifting up your gospel truth, Lord, we bless them as you would bless us. Also, God, we do not forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. We pray that you encourage them, strengthen them, lift them up, God. May they endure to the end. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement and we say, Amen. Amen. Today, as we launch into this new series on grace, I want you to open your Bibles to John, the Gospel of John, chapter number one. In John chapter number one, I liken it to the genesis of the New Testament. There's some language in John chapter one that mirrors Genesis chapter one. And as we look at grace, we find the word grace in John chapter one, verse number 14. It's a very familiar verse to each and every one of us. Speaking of Jesus, talking about the Word, Jesus is seen as the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Verse number 14 of John chapter 1 says this, And the Word became flesh. So we know that God broke from his side of his own nature himself and said, Today you are my son, I've begotten you. That was Jesus. And there was a moment that Jesus just robed of his glory in eternity and he stepped down into time and humanity. He was robed in flesh, born in a manger, born very humbly, didn't come in a king's palace, didn't come with great shouts of men and women on the earth. No, he did come with shouts of angels. And so here he is, God Almighty, robed in flesh. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus literally dwelt among us. He literally lived in an earth suit, in an earth tent. And he lived a life for 33 years on this planet. And it says this, And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. They saw the works that Jesus did. They saw the goodness of God that proceeded forth from who Jesus was. And, and they beheld it. it. It was amazing. It was appearing to all. It, it was bright. It, it, was, it was wonderful. The things that Jesus did. In fact, another scripture says that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who oppressed the devil. Jesus came and he destroyed the works of the devil. It was manifest. It was open to all. It created quite a stir. People knew about it all over the place. But then look at the rest of the verse. It says, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth full of grace and truth. Now we have to ask ourselves this question. If we're going to start a series on grace, we have to ask the question, what is grace? We've got to find out what grace really is. Now, presently, in Christian circles, there are a lot of definitions of grace floating around. Some of them, I believe, are really good definitions. I believe that they're strong definitions. Some of them are a little cloudy, a little foggy. I understand the idea behind them. But I don't think they quite convey really the emphasis of what grace is. I want to examine a couple of these definitions. First one I want to examine 
is the one that I find in the Amplified Bible. I really like the Amplified Bible. What they did with the Amplified Bible is they, they wrote it out. It's a translation. And then as they hit certain words, they decided to amplify what that word means. So they would hit a word like salvation. And then they would start to amplify it by adding additional words, additional explanation. And they would expand on the definition of certain words so that we understand really what the original language was talking about when it was talking about that word. And I noticed in the Amplified Bible, when you come to the word grace, you will often find that it will say grace, and then it will amplify the word grace by saying God's unmerited favor. God's unmerited favor. This would mean that grace itself is the favor of God. So what does the favor of God mean? That means the kindness, the blessing of God. And if it's unmerited, that means that we didn't earn it. That it was something that was freely handed to us by God. Now, what I know of grace and what I see in the Bible, when I see that, hey, we didn't work to receive it. It's not something based on how good we are. We know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And therefore, when it comes to grace, especially the grace that saves us, we know that it is by grace you have been saved through faith, right? So when it comes to salvation, I couldn't save myself. I couldn't get myself out of the pit of death. I couldn't work my way up. I, I, I couldn't meet the righteous requirement of the law in myself. So it had to be the unmerited favor of God, that God's blessing and kindness would be bestowed on me and given to me regardless of my actions. It had to be unmerited. So I would say that that's a pretty good definition. But what about for Jesus? Because if Jesus came to the earth, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, would that definition match with Jesus? Now, someone could take me on the mat with this and say, well, wait a second, Pastor, hold on, because Jesus was full of grace and truth. That means he was full of God's unmerited favor because Jesus is God in the flesh. And therefore, because he was full of grace, it wasn't for him, it was for others. That Jesus is the grace giver. Again, I would agree. Jesus is the grace giver. Jesus is God. But where I would part with you is this. Is that Jesus, while he was on the earth, needed the grace of God. And I'm about ready to show you a scripture that proves that to be true. Hebrews chapter 2. Turn there with me. Hebrews chapter number 2. You guys ready for some Bible study? Hallelujah. I'm going to pull no punches in this church. Hebrews chapter 2. Take a look at verse number 9. Okay? The author of Hebrews has started out, he's talking about how Jesus is God, how he shows us and reveals to us the Father. He's talking about how Jesus is greater than the angels. And in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 9, look at what it says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, capital A, speaking of Jesus, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Jesus, in order to taste death for everyone, did it by the grace of God. That's what we just saw in the scripture. I just proved it to you. And the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, so we see that Jesus was full of grace and truth. And now we see that Jesus, by the grace of God, tasted death for everyone. That means that Jesus not only was full of the grace of God, but that he had the grace of God working on his behalf. Now, did Jesus have the favor of God? Absolutely. Because we know that when the heavens split, when Jesus was baptized, and the dove descended on Jesus out of the heavens, and God in his mighty voice spoke, what did he say? This is my son whom I love. With him I am well 
please. Jesus had the favor of God. Jesus is God's favorite son, right? He's the firstborn. He gets the double portion. Of course he has the blessing and the kindness of God upon his life. Jesus had the favor of God, but was it unmerited? If anybody merited favor, it would have been Jesus, right? Come on, talk to me tonight. It's okay. All right, there's not a wrong answer here. You could say no, but you'd have to prove it to me from the Bible. But here's the deal. Jesus deserved the favor of God, right? Because he came and he lived a perfect, spotless, sinless life because he's God in the flesh. And so therefore, Jesus could have earned the favor of God. Jesus merited it. Jesus was perfect and is perfect. So that means that grace for us, yes, is unmerited favor. I would agree with that definition for us. But for Jesus, it's not unmerited. Jesus merited the favor of God. Jesus had it and Jesus deserved it. So that means that our definition of grace has to go beyond just for us, right? Because if Jesus had it, it has to be something more than just unmerited favor. Is everybody tracking with me? I'm leading you somewhere, okay? So so go on the trip with me. Now, most of the other definitions of grace I've learned and been taught growing up in in church, because I was raised in church, and, uh, and, you know, when I got saved at age 15, I was in a a conservative church background, and they taught grace um, very loosely. They never really defined it for me. I remember we were in a Bible study one time and we were just reading through, I believe it was the Gospel of Luke, and as we came through the Gospel of Luke, we, we at one point started talking about grace. And one of the girls spoke up and she says, oh, I've got a great definition of grace. And the leader of the group said, well, share it with us. And she says, very happily, big smile on her face, I can remember the big smile on her face, brace face, man, she, she was just beautiful and had big braces and all that kind of stuff, and, and just with beaming, happy face said, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's a beautiful definition of grace, isn't it? I mean, very eloquently put, it it, it takes each letter of the word grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. It's easy to remember. My goodness, my teaching gift loves that, right? It just jumps out at that. Oh, I got to attach myself to that because it's easy to remember. All you got to remember is grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Again, I would say yes and amen. I would say that's a beautiful definition of grace. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus went to the cross and now we get God's riches because of what he did. But again, it falls short because when you apply it to Jesus, it's at his own expense. Doesn't really make sense, does it? Hmm. Okay, what about this one? I heard this in a popular Christian song, okay? Okay. That grace is when we get what we don't deserve. And mercy is when we don't get what we do deserve. Again, my teaching gift leaps. I love this. I think this is wonderful. I think this is very eloquently stated. I, I, I like the way that it shows us the difference between grace and mercy. And if grace was only... God's riches at Christ's expense, if it was only unmerited favor, then I would say that that's a really good definition, that we, we get what we don't deserve. We didn't deserve heaven. We didn't deserve salvation. No, we deserved hell and condemnation, but we, we didn't deserve it. Therefore, it was unmerited. It was unmerited favor. It was God's riches at Christ's expense. So grace would be when we get what we don't deserve. And mercy, though, that just makes sense when, when we don't get what we do deserve. Right? We deserved hell, but we didn't get it. We got mercy instead. We deserved condemnation and judgment, but instead, that was given to Jesus, and we were given his riches. But again, when you apply this to Jesus, it doesn't work. In fact, if you applied this to Jesus, it would almost be cruel. Think about it. When we get what we don't deserve, Jesus didn't deserve the cross. So was that grace? Okay, well, wait, that now, okay, let's, let's move on to mercy then. When we don't get what we do deserve, right? We, we don't get what we do deserve. So, so, so was it mercy for Jesus? 
See, it, it doesn't work. It only works if you stick with unmerited favor and God's riches at Christ's expense. But the fact that Jesus, through the grace of God, tasted death for everyone and that he was full of grace and truth shows me that we can't stop at definitions that only apply to us. It has to apply to Jesus too and therefore be all-encompassing. It has to be more than just unmerited favor. So then what is grace? Right? We, we asked that question a while ago and all we've done is define what it's not so far. Is that right? But sometimes you've got to go down those roads and break down those things like in the book of Jeremiah where God tells Jeremiah that you've got to uproot, tear down so that you can build and plant, right? Sometimes you have to take things down in order to build something up. Now that I've blown over the deck of cards of what grace could be that we built up in our minds as something, now let's build on the solid foundation of the word of God what grace truly is. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, the Apostle Paul has just finished some foolish, reluctant boasting, talking about all the great things that have been accomplished in his ministry. Then he's talked about how much suffering he's gone through, all the different things that have been painful in his life. Then finally, he starts to go back to a little bit more boasting, and he starts to talk about some things that uh, some scholars ha- have, have quarreled over, whether it applies to the Apostle Paul or whether it applies to someone else. But there's some fantastic things in this section of Scripture. He starts to talk about somebody who was caught up into heaven, saw things and heard things that can't be expressed. And then in verse number 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, He comes along and he says this, and he says, Unless I should be exalted above measure, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now, the Apostle Paul has just finished talking about someone who's been caught up into heaven and who's seen things and heard things that cannot be expressed on the earth. Many people believe that the Apostle Paul was talking about himself. Because there was a period of time where the Apostle went off into the desert and he just got with Jesus and for 14 years Jesus was teaching him, giving him revelations. In fact, the book of Romans is one of those revelations. It was the revelation of of the new dispensation of grace, like we're talking about. And so because this guy had so many revelations, because of the things that were happening to him, he started to get exalted above measure. Now, sometimes we read that and we think that God must have seen Paul getting exalted above measure and wanted to cut him down, so God sent him the thorn in the flesh. But the apostle doesn't say God did it. The apostle says it was a messenger of who? Satan, right? So that means here's the Apostle Paul, and here's the community around him. And the Apostle Paul started to raise up with the revelations of God, started to get exalted above measure. There was a measuring line. Everybody was kind of here, and the Apostle Paul started learning something about God, and he started coming up. The devil saw the Apostle Paul rising above the crowd and said, he is my target now. Unless he get exalted above the measure of everybody else, I'm going to take him out. Okay? So he says it was a thorn in the flesh, so this was not a spiritual thing, this was a natural thing that was occurring, a messenger of Satan. That means there was a spiritual thing that was connected to something in the flesh. I personally believe that it was the Jews that were following him from place to place to place to place, hindering his ministry, buffeting him. See, it was a messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure. Buffeting was like the beating of the waves on the shore that just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. You will find that he suffered in Antioch. He suffered in Iconium. He suffered in Lystra. He suffered in Derby. He suffered at the hands of the Jews. Every place he went, here they are. They're following around. There's a riot at Ephesus. They want to kill him. Then he goes to Jerusalem. Here's the Jews fasting and waiting so that they can kill him. Everywhere he went, the Jews followed him around and tried to hinder his ministries, being a messenger sent of the devil to buffet him 
lest he be exalted above measure. Okay? So we see the predicament Paul's in. Now look at what it says in verse number 8. It said, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So he says, I went to prayer. I talked to God about it. I asked God, take this thorn in the flesh away. Stop the buffeting. God, remove it from me. And he says he pleaded, he begged the Lord three times that it be removed. Now look at God's response to Paul. We would have thought God would have said, okay, I'll do it for you. Sure thing, Paul. You're the great apostle. You're getting exalted above measure. You've got the abundance of revelations. Let's remove this thorn from your side. But look at what he says. Verse number nine, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Right there in these words of Jesus, some of you have the red letter edition Bible, you'll notice that that is written in red. That means that Jesus is speaking to Paul. Jesus, who is the grace giver, says something to the Apostle Paul. He says, I'm not going to remove the problem from you because my grace is sufficient. In other words, if it was just unmerited favor, if it was just God's riches at Christ's expense, if it was just when we get what we don't deserve, we're confused and we're wondering, what does that even mean? How does unmerited favor help someone who's going through a problem here on the earth? But then the Lord Jesus himself defines it in his next statement. My grace is sufficient for you for my, what? Strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, Jesus used the terms grace and strength interchangeably. That means that the grace of God is the strength of God. The grace of God is the divine ability and power of God. That means when we read it like that, let's, let's, let's use the word interchangeably for a second, shall we? And he said to me, my strength is sufficient for you, for my grace is made perfect in weakness. Now all of a sudden it makes a little bit more sense, doesn't it? Well, let's, let's read on. Let's see what else it says. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. Now, wait a second. We just heard Jesus say, my grace is sufficient for you, right? My strength is made perfect in weakness. And now the apostle says that the power of Christ... He didn't go back to grace. He didn't go back to strength. He said, the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, grace is the ability of God. Grace is the power of God. Grace is the strength of God. But it goes on in the next verse. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak... Then I am strong. I grappled with that for years. Why would you be strong when you're weak? I don't understand that. I never really understood why weakness equaled strength until I got a hold of the real definition of grace. Because I always figured that grace was only for my salvation, that it was just God's riches at Christ's expense. That I could have heaven because Jesus went to the cross, which is absolutely true, and I 100% agree with. I don't want you to get me wrong. But if all it stopped at was unmerited favor, then I would never understand why weakness equaled strength. The reason why I understand this verse now is because I got a hold of the real definition of grace. I want to put it up on the overheads for you. This is how we define grace. Grace at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. Grace is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. Plain and simple. 
So now we know. But let's say it together just to make sure that we get it in our hearts. I want you to say this out loud together with me. There's something powerful that happens when you speak. Okay? And I want you to say this. Okay? I'll say grace, and then I want you guys to say God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. Not that fast, so we'll say it slow. Okay? <sighs> Take a breath. Ready? Grace. God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. Let's say it again. Grace. God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. One more time. Grace. God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. See, this is God's power in me to do what I couldn't do on my own. Well, let's see if this applies to Jesus, shall we? Because the problem that we had with all of our other definitions of grace was that they didn't apply to Jesus. But if Jesus tasted death by the grace of God, then that would have meant that Jesus had God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on his behalf when he couldn't do it on his own, right? Does that apply to Jesus? Absolutely it does, right? Because Jesus in the flesh, Jesus was so invested in the human experience that he actually subjected himself to weakness and frailty of the human condition while he was here on the earth. Now that was not according to sin because Jesus had no sin. But it was according to the flesh. Remember, Jesus was hungry while he was here on the earth. You can find him hungry. You can find him thirsty. You can find Jesus so tired from ministry that he fell asleep in a boat that was in the middle of a storm. And yet, to him, it was rocking him to sleep like a little baby, right? You can find that Jesus, as a child, grew up and grew in wisdom and stature. He had to learn things. Isn't that amazing? That boggles my mind that God had to learn something, right? And yet in the book of Hebrews, it says he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. See, Jesus had to cling to God. Jesus had to pray while he was here on the earth. That right there should boggle your mind because that's God talking to himself. So that means that Jesus in the flesh subjected himself to weakness and therefore on his own couldn't do it. That's why by the grace of God, he tasted death. And that's why he was full of grace and truth. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth. So now we understand what grace is. We're weak in the flesh. And we don't have the ability to do things on our own. In fact, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing, right? We need the grace of God. We need the ability of God on our behalf to get the job done when we can't do it. Well, let's apply that to salvation for a second, right? We couldn't save ourselves. We needed grace, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we couldn't do it. Does it apply? Absolutely it applies. Wow, it makes more sense now, right? It's God's power to save us when we couldn't save ourselves. Wow, wow. All of a sudden, the word just comes alive. See, we couldn't succeed in life. We can't heal ourselves. We can't be gifted enough to make a difference in the world. It's only by the grace of God that we can be saved, that we can overcome, that we can be delivered, we can make a difference, and we can be successful. This is God's power for life. Come on, somebody. Grace is God's power for life. How important is this? Well, let's turn back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 once again. Back in John chapter number 1, it doesn't stop with that one statement about grace. It goes on. John chapter 1, verse number 16 and verse number 17. John chapter 1, verse number 16 says this, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. Now notice that he says something interesting there. First of all, i got to point out, of his fullness. Whose fullness are we talking about? Jesus, right? Because Jesus came and he was full of grace and truth. Jesus is God in the flesh. And of God in the flesh's fullness, we have received. You have received Jesus into your heart. That means that Jesus, who was full of grace and truth, the Spirit of Christ now lives in you, so you are full 
of the Spirit of Christ. That means you're full of the one who is full of grace and truth. Think about this. It's almost like when you see someone that has two balloons. And they blow one balloon up and then they stick a deflated balloon inside the other one. And then they start to blow the other balloon up. What happens to the balloon on the outside? It has to expand as well, right? Jesus, when he gets on the inside of you, starts to expand your life. He starts to blow things up a little bit, right? He starts to stretch you. Because of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. Notice that he says grace for grace. Two times he says grace. And grace for grace, what is he saying? In the original Greek language, when they would say something like this, what they're really doing is they're emphasizing something. My wife is so funny. She has a a term that she uses. There's a term that she talks about when she's going shopping. I heard her on the phone with her best friend one day, and they were talking about shopping. And she says, yeah, I'm going shopping. Not shopping, shopping, but just shopping. And I had to scratch my head and look at her and say, honey, what on earth are you talking about right now? Because it just sounded like a foreign language to me. And she says, well, you know, I'm not going shopping, shopping. We're just going shopping. And I said, honey, we're going to the grocery store. That, I, I don't understand why that's not shopping, shopping. That's just shopping. She says, no, that grocery store, the stuff that you don't really want to buy when you have to go to the hardware store, you're shopping, but that's not shopping, shopping. I said, well, then enlighten me, honey. What is shopping, shopping? She says, oh, shopping, shopping. That's when I'm going and looking for a dress. That's when I'm going and looking for a new purse. That's when I'm going shoe shopping. Come on, ladies. You know the difference between shopping and shopping, shopping? Oh, yeah, you do. How about this? Is it a kiss? Or was it a kiss, kiss? Come on, somebody. You know, you give your mama a kiss, but give your wife, you give her a kiss, kiss, right? Hello. Yeah. You know, you're watching the movie and the leading man finally comes in and he grabs that woman. He didn't give her just a kiss. No, it was a kiss, kiss, right? See, we understand those terms. So here he says, of his fullness we have received and grace for grace. Not just grace, but grace, grace. Now you understand what the author of Hebrews is saying. This is the fullness of the abundance, the biggest measure of grace that you can have of his fullness. See, it's not a man ability. This is a God ability. This is not a natural thing. This is a supernatural thing. Verse number 17 says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the grace giver. And it's only in relationship with Jesus Christ that you're going to receive the grace that you need for your life. The sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. We've received Jesus into our hearts and he's full of grace and truth then he's the power source. You have to tap in to Jesus to receive the ability of Jesus. It happens in the word and it happens in prayer because Jesus is the word and when you pray, you connect with God. Let me show you in the book of Hebrews. Turn there quickly with me. Hebrews chapter four, verse number 16. A couple more verses and we'll wrap up tonight. Hebrews chapter 4, last verse in Hebrews chapter 4 says this, verse number 16. Very familiar verse, but hopefully tonight it just pops off and comes alive. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says this, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Well, wait, 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 wait. Let's put our definition in there, shall we? Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. That we may obtain mercy, and find grace, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it to help in a time of need. Wow, now all of a sudden it starts to pop off the page, doesn't it? It just starts to make so much sense. See, in your prayer life, you have been given entrance 
into the throne room. You can go into the very presence of Almighty God Himself. Why? Because of the grace of God. See, it used to be that the high priest could only enter into the most holy place where God was once a year and not without the blood of a bull or of a goat. But now, here, Jesus has gone in once and for all and He has opened the way for us. The Bible says, through the veil that is His flesh. And now we've been given entrance and our hope now hangs there inside the veil. That means that we can pull on that anchor and it can pull us back to a place with God where we can come into the very presence of God. Anytime you want to be with God, all you have to do is just go to God in prayer. And if you're in need of help, if you're in need of some strength, if you're in need of some ability, if you have fallen short, if you're weak, if you can't make it, if you can't do it, all you got to do is go to God and say, God, I need your help. I I need your strength. I need your grace. And Jesus is the grace giver because he's full of grace and truth. And he is the well that can never run dry. And he will fill you up. He will pour it out. It will overflow. And he will do amazing things in your life. My goodness. My goodness. He is the grace giver. So you come and you receive the grace of God in prayer and through the word. And you'll find it applies to every area of your life. Remember we said this, this is the power for life. This is the ability of God on our behalf when we can't do it. Can't make your kids healthy and growing in the things of God. You can't make business happen. Can't make a difference in the world. Can't change your community. You can't do it on your own. You need the grace, the ability of God on your behalf when you can't do it. One last verse for tonight, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 10. 1 Peter chapter 4 makes this statement in verse number 10. Let's take a look at it. We're talking about every area of our life. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse number 10 says this. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. It's an interesting statement there, isn't it? The manifold grace of God. That means it's the manifold power of God on our behalf when we can't do it to get the job done. But that word manifold literally means many-sided, many-colored. And that's why we have the diamond up there on the overheads behind me. It's because manifold literally gives the idea of many colors that when you take that diamond and you hold it up to the light and you start to spin it, what happens? Like a prism, it starts to disperse the colors. And as the light passes through that diamond, you'll see blues and greens and reds and oranges and yellows, all these different hues as you spin that diamond. The grace of God is the same way. It applies to every area of your life. It has many sides. And as you start to examine the grace of God and you spin around, you'll say, hey, it applies to my job. Isn't that crazy? Well, look at over here. It applies to my family. Well, look at when I, when I, when I tilt it this way. It, it applies to my witness. Well, well, look over here. It, it applies to my future. Well, look at on this side. It applies to my relationships. It applies to my marriage. It, it applies to my business dealings. It applies to my integrity. It, it applies to my purity. It, it applies to every area. And as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, we need to use the grace of God in our lives because it applies to every area. It is power for life. In this series, we're going to talk about the grace of God for salvation. We're going to talk about the grace of God for sanctification, being set apart from the world. And talk about the grace of God for stewardship, what we do with what we have. We're going to talk about the grace of God for service when we start to minister to other people. And we're going to talk about the grace of God as it applies in every area of our life. Part number one. Grace, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. It's going to be a great series. I want to encourage you guys to hang around with us. Bring someone with you next week. Like I mentioned, share a link, share a post. Make sure that they get on board with where we're at so that they can come in next week and we can have a good time in the things of God. I'd like everybody to remain seated during this time. I want everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to take just about five minutes of your time, then I'll let you go. So if you guys can just hang with me for about five minutes, okay? I'll let you go right after that. Tonight we talked about the grace of God, the ability of God on your behalf when you can't do it. And I want to just talk to you about your life right where you're at for a moment. We understand very clearly from what we heard tonight that you cannot save yourself. You cannot do enough good works. You can't attend enough church. 
You can't know enough scriptures. You can't be good enough to people. You can't give enough money. You can't volunteer enough in church or in a social justice cause. You can't be famous enough, cool enough, smart enough, nice enough. You can't be born in the right area on the earth. No, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And tonight, maybe you came into this place and you've been trying to work your way up to get to heaven. Maybe tonight you came in and you feel like you've been good enough to get to heaven. Or maybe on the opposite side of that coin tonight, you feel like you've been too bad to get into heaven. You don't really know why you came tonight. Maybe you're just trying to make peace with God. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus already made peace at the cross. And that because Jesus went to the cross and suffered and died, that he took the punishment for your sin. And that's where our definition does apply. That now because Jesus went to the cross, that he gives us what we don't deserve, his grace, his ability to save us when we couldn't do it ourselves. And his mercy is extended to us because hell is a very real place, but you don't have to go there now because God extends his mercy to you. And you don't get what you do deserve. But that doesn't happen because you're in church. It doesn't happen because you're good. It doesn't happen because you're smart or nice or because uh, you, you know, you've, you've done a lot of good deeds or because you were raised in church or because you volunteered. It doesn't happen by any of those means. It happens when you come to that point, like we talked about of weakness, where you give up your own strength and you say, God, I can't save myself. I need you to save me. And in doing so, you surrender all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ. It's called being born again in the Bible. Not the goofy, weirdo stuff you've seen in Hollywood movies, television books, and the internet, but what the Bible says about being born again. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, being born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life, that you've surrendered to him. Haven't tried to clean up yourself, haven't tried to do everything yourself, haven't tried to be good enough, haven't tried to attend enough church. No, that you have surrendered. You've said, God, I can't save myself. I need you to do it. I give you everything. I give you all my heart. I give you all my life. And that at that point where you believe in God, that God now, by his grace, comes and saves your soul. He reaches out and gets a hold of your life and he takes that dead life that you were in and in his ability, his power, he raises you up again to new life, gives you a brand new spirit, brand new start with a brand new heart. Tonight, I want to offer you guys that grace. Tonight, I want to offer you that opportunity. With every head bowed and every eye closed tonight in this place, as you're considering where you're at with God, if you don't know if you died tonight where you would end up, or maybe tonight if you face eternity and you say, would I go to heaven or hell? You say, I think I would. I hope I would. Maybe I would. Listen, you can't think hope or maybe your way into the kingdom of God. You've got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I want to give you that opportunity to receive that grace tonight. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang. Just raise your hand if you need to give God all your heart and all of your life. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. Maybe you can connect eyes with me at that moment and then you can put your hand right back down. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. After I count all the hands tonight, I'm going to call you forward and we're going to pray together to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You're going to receive that grace and you're going to be born again. And if you want to be included in that prayer tonight, it's as simple as raising your hand in a moment when I count to three and pop my hands together. Who should raise your hand if you're not sure about your salvation tonight? Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before? Giving God all of your heart and all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? Maybe you've been delaying it, trying to clean up your act. Or maybe tonight you feel far away and you, you've been searching. Tonight is your night of salvation. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart. You say, well, what is lukewarm? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. Jesus said, I want to find you hot or cold, but if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Only people that are not real Christians will be vomited from the mouth of Jesus. So tonight, if that's you, and I just nailed it when I described that, you say, yeah, that's me. 
you ready to get your hand up. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're out watching by television, in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe, come on, get ready to get your hand up, and then you can come back into the church service, or you can tell an usher right afterwards. If you're online, hey, come on, I want to pray with you too. Raise your hand. God's watching. God sees wherever you're at all over the world right now. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. That's you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. Who else tonight? Three wise people. There's four. Got you over there. There's four wise people. Anybody else real quick? Five. Got you over there. Six. Thank you right here. Got you. God bless you. There's six people. Seven up there in the family room. Got you. Eight over here. Got you. Thank you. Nine right here. Thank you. Who else tonight? You want to receive the grace of God. You're saying, yeah, I want to be included in that prayer tonight. If that's you, just raise it up high real quick. I'm going to make one more sweep, and then we're going to pray together. Anybody else real quick that I did not already see? Or that you're saying, man, I really want to be included in that prayer tonight. If that's you, just lift it up high for me right now. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. Hey, everybody. Come on, look up here at me. Everybody, let's do this. Let's all stand. And if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, it's not too late. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. We're going to pray together tonight. Can't do that till we get you down here. So let's go tonight. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Come on down to the front. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Come on, anybody else, if you need to come, just come on right now. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. There's room for you up here tonight. Anybody else? Anybody else, just come on right now. Come on. Come on down. Come on down if that's you. From the family rooms, you can bring your children. They're welcome at this time. Come on. Anybody else? All right. Hey, you guys, just like I promised, we're going to pray together. Simple prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again, okay? This time, I'm going to pray a simple prayer out loud. If you have the ability, just repeat it out loud right after me, okay? If you mess up on some words, it's okay, all right? This is not about the words of your mouth. This is about the attitude of your heart going before the Lord. So right now, let's all bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And I want you to say these words out loud together with me. Everybody join in. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name, to give you all of my heart. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me my sin. Cleanse me of my past. Wash me with your blood. And give me a new start with a new heart today. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He came, that He died, and He was raised again to life just for me. Thank you, Jesus. Let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm headed for heaven, leaving hell behind. Fill me now with your spirit, with your grace, and with your truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, come on. Let's give the Lord some praise tonight. So good. All right. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine, right over here to my right and left, this is Pastor Joel, really good guy, he wants to give you some free information, talk to you about something that'll help you get strong in the ways of the Lord, it's easy, it's free, okay, listen to him, then in a couple minutes, he'll let you come right back out, just take a couple minutes of your time, so if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way, let's give him a hand as they go, hallelujah. Hallelujah.